Well, hi everyone, Sean Humphreys here. Welcome to All Things Retirement. In this installment, we're going to talk about why individual investors underperform. There's a lot of frustrated investors out there. I'm going to talk about the reasons for their underperformance. We'll talk about a strategy for uh, overcoming these particular issues that investors struggle with. Now, if you're new to this channel, make sure that you hit the subscribe button. We're posting content all the time, quite frankly, on all things retirement. So if you don't want to miss any of the installments, make sure you click subscribe. And if you like the video, be sure to hit like. Now, individual investor performance, there are a lot of uh, frustrated investors out there, and there are a whole constellation of reasons for the underperformance. Now, we're just going to talk about one branch of those reasons. There's several different branches. We'll talk about that one branch in a second. And we're also going to talk about a potential solution that you can use to overcome these issues. Now, your retirement hangs in the balance in terms of how you deal with these underperformance issues. Before you retire, quite frankly, investing is kind of easy. From the, not easy emotionally, but easy from the standpoint of what you need to do to execute and achieve your goals. It's really about discipline, setting aside money, investing that money. But when you retire, it flips on its head. Now you're in a situation where you may not be working full time, you may be fully retired, maybe there's a bit of contract work, part time work, but you really are relying on some pensions and investment assets to fund the cash flow that you need. When you flip from putting money into your portfolio to taking money out of your portfolio, that's a major transition for most people, not just financially, but also, also emotionally. Now, if you look at this chart, this chart is um, um, information that's summarized from a study that was conducted by Delbar. Delbar is a research organization in the financial industry. And this study um, was using a date ending the end of December 2013. It doesn't really matter what time frame that we pick. This illustration really applies no matter what time frame. And what they did is they look at fund investors' returns fall short of the market. And they looked at 30 years, 20 years, 10 years five years, 12 months. So you have time period. We've got the investors equity fund returns. So they were using US stock mutual funds in their study. The Standard & Poor's 500 index, that's the broad US stock index, 500 largest companies. And then we've got the gap between the two. So if you look at 30 years, in the 30 years up until December 31st of 2013, the average investor earned 3.69% and the index itself was 11.11%, so that the performance gap was 7.42%. It's a huge gap between what the market um, gave to investors and what investors actually experienced themselves. If I go 20 years, um, investor returns are 5.02%, 9.22% .02 uh, for the index, 4.2% as the performance gap. So again, pretty consistent, you know, consistent theming here. Over 10 years, the average investor's equity mutual funds did 5.88%, 7.4% for the index, 1.52% was a performance gap. Every time you look at the time periods, there is a gap between what the index does and what investors did. Now, um, it has a really significant impact, and we'll talk about the reasons for this performance gap. Um, one of the things that the um, study did is it looked at if you put $100,000 in your portfolio in 1984 in the S&P 500 stock index, the portfolio would have grown to $2,358,275 by that 2013 um, date. The average investor earning 3.69% would have grown a portfolio to $296,556. That represents a difference in value of over $2,000,000, $2,061,719 uh, is really the difference. That's a huge, massive difference. And, you know, the, the authors of the study, they did say, well, you know, there's no performance management fees on the index, uh, whereas these equity fund investors did have management fees. But even after accounting for management fees to tap into the market, um, there was still this underperformance. So when we took a look at the data, um, it's pretty compelling um, and it makes a huge difference in terms of performance. And so to illustrate the, the, uh, the point even further, um, this is a picture of uh, Peter Lynch. And Peter Lynch was um, the portfolio manager for the, one of the flagship mutual funds uh, offered by Fidelity Investments in the United States. Uh, it was a Magellan Fund 
And Peter Lynch was the main portfolio manager for that account from um, uh, 1977 to 1990. So we had a 13-year tenure on that portfolio. Um, and that portfolio had an astounding return. Uh, the return was 29% per year. So by anyone's standards, it was absolutely remarkable performance. Now, as a consequence of that performance, obviously the Magellan Fund got a lot of interest. So investors were just piling into that investment fund uh, on a very, very large level to take advantage of Peter Lynch's investment experience. So again, 29% per year, um, and that was extraordinary. And for whatever reason, Fidelity decided to take a look at what the returns were on the investor's personal accounts by investing in that product. Okay, so they looked at Peter Lynch's performance over that 13 years, and then they look at the average account performance of people that held the Magellan Fund during that time period. And the results that they got were absolutely shocking. They found that the average investor purchasing units in the Magellan Fund between 1977 and 1990 actually lost money. Um, if these investors were astute enough to pick out Peter Lynch as a great portfolio manager, how in the world were they able to lose money on a portfolio that averaged a compounded return of 29% per year uh, over that time period? Now, a little bit of a backstory. Uh, Peter Lynch had a particular style of investing. I remember reading a book that Peter Lynch had written, and in that book he had a chapter, I think it was called The Ten Bagger Approach for Investors, where you know, take 10 really aggressive stocks, all you need is one of those stocks to hit a home run, and your overall portfolio returns could be very good. Now, I don't know how much he applied that particular philosophy to the management of the Magellan Fund, but that fund could be pretty volatile uh, from time to time. So I suspect what happened is a lot of people were drawn into using Peter Lynch as a portfolio manager because they liked the returns that he had been giving, but they didn't take into account their investment temperament. There is an emotional piece to investing for sure. And when they were going through periods of excessive volatility and maybe excessive volatility in their minds, uh, they bailed at the wrong time. So what you begin to see in the sale of units, the purchase of units in the Magellan Fund is the typical thing you see. Investors piling into that investment fund at the high end of the market and investors selling out of that fund at the low end of the market. So in spite of you know having money with a portfolio manager that was extraordinary, their emotions and the psychology of investing that, that you know they should have had wasn't there and they panicked or they had anxiety and they sold out of their positions and it really, really hurt their performance. So again, the average unit holder lost money or didn't make money during that 13 year period. Peter Lynch averaged 29% per year, extraordinary. So let's take a look at some of the main reasons that we see um, this underperformance taking place. Um, and so I'm gonna go through some of the main pieces and I wanna share with you that um, there are different branches to underperformance. And um, I'll give you an example of one branch. So one branch would be purely the analytics of retirement income planning. So if we specialize in retirement income planning. So we'll have clients uh, share with us what their goals are. We'll do financial forecasting. We've got some very powerful models that help us do that. And we'll do the forecasting. And that forecasting will help us to understand what kind of return that we need to get on their financial assets to fund the retirement. That's a really uh, important um, you know, analysis to do. Um, there's a lot of people out there that don't have that analysis done. So they're flying blind. And that's one of the reasons that people can underperform. They've never done the analysis. They don't have a plan. What I'm going to talk about, though, is, is really the, the emotional piece of underperformance. And so let's take a look at a few areas that really drive underperformance. And so this chart illustrates that we've got something called performance chasing, casino investing, uh, Me Too investing is another example, uh, news-based investing, and fear and greed, and greed investing. I think by just looking at each of those headings, you kind of know what I'm talking about. Performance chasing. Well, performance chasing was exactly what was happening with the Magellan Fund. So you had investors that saw an investment that had done really well, and they were chasing that performance. 
But what those investors didn't take into account is the fact that there's often an inverse relationship between the performance of an investment and whether or not you should buy it. So particularly with capital markets, it could be the bond market, it could be the stock market. When something's really, really doing well, that's maybe a cue for us for you to take some profits off the table, become a little more cautious. And when there are bargains, when the markets aren't doing well, history has shown that's a time to become more aggressive with your strategy. But it's very difficult emotionally to do that. So we tend to go after the investments that really look great, but unfortunately they look great in the rear view mirror. Uh, it's now probably too late. So that's one reason. Casino investing. There are a group of investors who view um, the markets as kind of like a casino. There's a, a rush. Um, they want to get the next best tip. Uh, they talk to their broker about the next best high-flying investment idea. Uh, they're very aggressive and they like the adrenaline rush of investing. The unfortunate thing is that leads often to very poor decision making about the investments that they should be purchasing for their portfolio and it leads to excessive volatility and that excessive volatility means that those investors don't stay in the game long enough to get the returns that they want. We also have the me too mentality which is more the influence that the people around us uh, have whether it's friends or co-workers or family members talking about their 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 latest and greatest in investment uh, that they've purchased and so we want to get in on the action and so that peer group influence the influence of the people around us um, is excessive for some people and they begin making investment decisions that there was no analysis no planning they never sat down with an advisor or an investment counselor to confirm what their goals were and what specific investments were appropriate for them. Everyone's unique and they need to build a portfolio that's unique to their particular circumstances. News-based influence um, is a huge one these days. So news firms and investment firms and investment outlets and social media, uh, they're creating sensational headlines to get you to click on those headlines. And um, we've done blog posts on the past uh, Warren Buffett, the famous investor, has talked about just the sheer folly of listening to the news to guide your investment decisions. It's just, it just it's not something you should be doing. It's all about clickbait and viewership, and it's not really about providing good information. Um, we've talked about the influence of the media uh, often in our podcast, and it's something we have to be really, really aware of. It doesn't mean they're lying necessarily, and there's some good information in that, but you need to look at your portfolio as a process that needs to be looked at regularly as part of a financial plan, and you can't use the headline news to drive your decisions. Fear and greed investing, again, um, that's a little bit like chasing returns. So we get on this emotional roller coaster and it drives our decisions. Okay, so let me just summarize some of these comments here a little bit by uh, these um, this particular chart which I think is a good one it kind of gives us a bit of an overview on what I'm talking about here so uh, Vanguard did a study looking at investors and they looked at the um, uh, uh, a particular stock index it's a Russell 3000 and what they found with the 3000 stocks in that index in the study 18.5% uh, lost at least 75% of their value 39% uh, of the stocks lost money uh, during the period. 64% uh, of the stocks underperformed the Russell 3000, which is the index that we use for stock reviews. And only 25% of the stocks were um, responsible for most of the market gains. Now, it's one of the reasons when we talk to you know, clients is that buying the broad indexes or buying a manager that is doing research on the sectors that would be appropriate to be allocating to is so critically important. The more narrow you get in your focus and the more you try to chase these winners and hopefully not hit the losers, the more concentrated you get, the higher the probability that you're gonna get it wrong. So there's some very basic principles around portfolio design that would put uh, the laws of probability firmly in your favor if you follow them. So in our estimation, coaching really is the answer. Now, when you think about it, what does a coach do? You know, whether it's a, a financial coach or a sporting coach in a particular sport, whether it's a life coach, whether it's a, a health coach or a diet coach, they, they get to know you. They spend some time talking about what your goals are, what you're trying to achieve. They then take a look at your current situation and try to identify gaps or maybe opportunities that could be exploited. 
they then develop an action plan using strategies and uh, and action plans to get you acting on those strategies and once they get you on that path they actually play a really critical role in being an accountability partner so when you're reporting to someone we all know this if you're going to a meeting and you're reporting your results of what you've done there's a higher probability if you're accountable you're going to follow through so they provide accountability and also encouragement we all need encouragement when we're pursuing our goals or trying to accomplish something uh, life's not this straight line up towards our goals there are things that get in the way we hit inertia we hit challenges and the coach is there to encourage you along the way and then the important review process. We want to review, reset, fine tune the plan if necessary. That coaching model is extremely, extremely powerful. And to the extent that it's followed, we're going to have a much higher probability of achieving our goals and objectives. Anyway, I hope that you enjoyed uh, the video. Again, if you haven't subscribed, hit the subscribe button. Hit the like button if you uh, got something out of this video. And in the notes with the video, you'll see links to various um, uh, documents and information pieces on wealth planning and retirement income planning. Don't hesitate to uh, reach out to our office if you'd like to start a conversation. You take care. Bye-bye.